So what I want to accomplish today is to go through the R program for some influence diagnostics, and that will cover changes in parameter estimates and fit statistics as a result of individual observations, and how to make a factor score inside of the Luan package so that you can then do assumption checking on the relationship between the latent variable and the manifest variable. Uh, I don't expect that that's going to take the entire time, so I will start off the next topic, which will be reliability and why you might want to care about it in structural equation modeling. So let's share the screen. So inside of R, I introduced the program code for us and talked a little bit about what each line means. We have two latent variables, intercept and slope. And the intercept factor has loadings fixed at the number one, and the slope factor has freely estimated loadings. And this is the basic model that we'll talk about when we get into growth modeling. Any structural model can be you know, in here that you have drawn in onyx. So if, for example, you're doing something less exotic, like a simple two predictor regression, you'll have a program here that will give you the parameter names. Um, so let me just come in and run that. I want to call up the library and I want to read in my data. Uh, and this is the same data set that I had which, in which I drew the Yonix diagram for. And this is the model specification section. Now, when you've specified this model, you have not yet run the program. You are just making a script that you're going to feed into Levon. So in order to execute Levon, we'll have the following code. I need to say what model I had. I need to say what the data are. In this case, I call that data model data up here. Um, this is something from Onyx. It just says that there's no fixed uh, axis in the model. And it says to do full information maximum likelihood as a way of handling missing data. Since this data set has no missing data, this doesn't really apply. It's just, again, standard code that Onyx puts out. So we can then run that. And after a while, you will see a greater than sign at the bottom indicating that the program has run. And to see the parameter estimates, we'll then execute the summary command. And let me make that a little bit bigger so we can talk about it. This is a little prettier than the Onyx output. It tells me what, I, what kind of minimization I did, maximum likelihood, how many observations I have. I have only one missing data pattern. That is, there is no missing data. And these things are the chi-square statistics. Uh, and we'll talk about what that is and what the independence null model is later. <clears throat> At this point, and we will introduce these when we get into a formal discussion of fit statistics, you'll see a variety of numbers here that indicate the degree to which the model fits well. And I'll talk about specifics later, but for now, I'm just going to say, these first two things, the CFI and TLI, it's good to have a number close to one. Uh, the TLI can even sometimes be a little bit larger than one. That's not a concern. And down here, so a, a bigger number here is good. For the chi-square model, a smaller number is better. So in this case, the chi-square test statistic for my model was seven and the p-value was 0.1. And again, we'll talk about that when we get into fit and how that happens. And then down here, we have something called the RMSEA. And for this one, a lower number is better. And the RMSEA also comes with a confidence interval indicating some brackets around that interval. 
Downstairs here in a slightly nicer user-friendly format, we see the loadings that we have. It's, if it's a fixed value, you don't have a significance level. If it's a freely estimated value, you will see a significance value. These are the wall tests and the p-value associated with those wall tests. When the parameters are named, you're going to see the name appear here. And when they're not named, you won't see anything here. So upstairs in our model statement, we have some names in here. And one thing that I've been in touch with the authors of the influence diagnostics is it seems like these packages in R do not handle parameter names well. So in this example, I wanted to have influence diagnostics for my last loading and I had to remove the name in order to that to run. And I'm in touch with the chap who's from Italy about how to fix that. Here's our covariances. And as I mentioned before, in the orthogonal latent basis growth curve model, the correlation is zero. These are the means of the intercept variable and the slope variable. And these are intercepts associated with each of the manifest variables. Downstairs, I have error variances that are estimated and the freely estimated random intercept variance and the slope variance that was set to one. Okay, so that's orienting that. So, and whenever you want, jump in with your questions. All right. So in order to call up the influence diagnostics that we have, the package is called influence.sem. I can invoke that library now. And the first thing that I can do is to look at influence diagnostics on these fit measures that I have. So you can put in any fit measure. In this case, I wanted to look at the individual observation influence on the TLI, the RMSEA, and the model chi-square. And I need to say what model I want to run. And that was the name of the model that in this particular example I've specified, and the data. So to call up that model, I will hit the run button and you will see upstairs here, it starts to look at the influence diagnostics for all 204 people. <clears throat> so if you're running a huge data set, like several thousand, uh, fire it up at night and come back later. To take a look at the influence diagnostics, I then say explore influence. So I might be interested in looking at whether the RMSEA jumps around a lot based on a particular observation. So I'll run that statement and then we'll zoom this out. And here we have a plot. So what you're looking at here are the observations in the data set from zero up to 200 some odd. And outside this band, these are the observations that would be perhaps influential. And that's you know, sometimes having that observation removed will increase the RMSEA. Sometimes removing that observation will decrease the RMSEA. <clears throat> so if you wanted to gain a point on the RMSEA, you might consider throwing out this particular individual. I have a question. Yep. Uh, here on the y-axis, the values seem too small. So I wonder uh, whether this um, point that looks like an outlier is really outlier. Like, make, uh, can they make a huge, uh, like can they influence can they influence um, the thing like, make, can they make a huge influence because the values are very small mm -hmm. on the y-axis? Well, the RMSEA is a number that approximate, approximates an adjustment to something called the non-centrality parameter of the chi-square distribution. Long story short, the RMSEA is always going to be a small number. So sometimes some people will say, 
a number below 0.03 is needed to have a good, a well-fitting model. So a change mm -hmm. from 0.01 is a pretty big one. Uh, mm -hmm. The other thing about this is the influence of, an obs of all the rest of the observations after you have removed one case is going to be different. So I can't necessarily say, I'm going to go through and rerun my model, throwing out, say, all of the people who are outside this band. Because maybe just removing this one individual down here or this one individual way up here is going to dramatically affect the overall fit of the model and everybody's influences are going to change. It does give you some insight into the general pathology of one particular observation. And so the, yeah. do we remove uh, one observation at a time then? Well, what I would say is it's your job to be the best detective you can be about this. Now, in this case, we have a relatively small number of observations. So if I flag those observations and come back and look at the raw data, I might gain some insight as to whether the, those particular observations need some kind of adjustment or whether I should actually remove them entirely from the study. Or if I should just, as part of my reporting, say, here are the children in my study. I ran the model in the interests of good reporting some of my conclusions about, in this case, the RMSEA are fairly contingent on including this, you know, these particularly aberrant individuals. And this is the object of some side analyses. You know, the, the thing that's a little frustrating about books in structural equation modeling is that there's this rush to show you all kinds of models and that leads to two unfortunate things. People think in the first case, oh, all I need to do is copy this, apply it to my data set, hit the run button and write it up. And that's not true. Uh, the analyses that you see in a book or in a published article are the result of several months of work. And you know, even in the projects that you do for this class, you're going to have a good start. You'll have probably a very good model done but you won't have been able to do all of the analyses that a thorough job would be for your dissertation or thesis. And you know, the side analyses are informative. And this is why you know, God gave master's thesis and doctoral dissertations appendices. And just to give you a bit of avuncular advice, advice like an uncle, what you need to do is to put, think of all of the good side analyses you want to do and put them in appendices because after you graduate or after you defend the thesis, you're going to be faced with this task of taking your research and boiling it down to maximum 25 pages. And you'll send it out for review. And in that paper, it really looks good to reviewers and an editor to say, I thought of everything that could go wrong. And this is covered in Appendix J or Appendix M and Appendix O in my paper. It tells reviewers you did a careful job. The other nice thing about it is if a reviewer says, and I still want to see it, you can cut and paste that appendix out of your thesis or dissertation and put it in the action letter back to the editor and as a reviewer supplement. And that saves you a lot of time and it also, you know, looks like you're not as prone to all of the criticisms that a reviewer would have. You know, the funny thing is, you know, this is, again, advice. One of the frustrations of graduate training is that in your life as a researcher, you're going to do the very best job you can and you'll send your article out. And when it comes back, it will be rejected. And there will not be a lot of encouragement in the action letter. And the reviewers will seem like really stupid people and just plain mean. And very often, my frustration is that's where the game ends for a lot of people because 
in their education so far, they've always gotten A's, they've always done well on tests, and here was this giant negative experience. But you need to not lose heart. It is also the case you probably need to show the rejection letter and the editor's letter to somebody in the area or your research team to think about whether it can be fixed. So that's for the minor professional sermon for the morning. Something we don't often tell people. We just oh, hurry up and write the thing out and submit it. But there's a little bit of hand holding that needs to happen here. Um, this is a picture. It might be a little bit nicer for to have larger dots or darker dots. We can also look at the influence diagnostics that are associated with the chi square. And let's zoom that out. And this is what the pattern looks like. It looks, you know, again, like those observations that were affecting the RMSA are probably the same observations that are affecting the chi-square. And finally, downstairs here, these are the fit statistics for the TLI. So, you know, on this one, in terms of overall fit, it seems like we, we do have a few people up here. If you threw them out, you're going to increase the TLI. But look at the scale. I mean, these are very minor changes to the overall model fit. So maybe there's an idiom in English, is the game worth the candle? Is it worth bothering to redo the analyses, throwing these people out? If the object is to explore, are you going to change the TLI very much? Downstairs, we have a person here who, if we threw them out, is going to result in a decrease in the TLI. So those things can happen. To save you the time of trying to figure out what's going on, Explore Influence also gives you the row numbers of the people in your data set who are you know, beyond those cuts. So you can take a look at that, you know, that might get you to exactly who is doing what in terms of those models. Uh, you can, if you want, do some plots that are a little nicer and then use the plot statement to actually generate those numbers and I can change the point size on the dots. So it's still running up to 204. No. So if you like, those dots are a little nicer. Uh, and if you want, you can copy the horizontal reference lines for that. <clears throat> if you're trying to you know, make this plot the object of a supplemental table. All right, so that's one way to take a look at the question of, is there an individual observation and are they going to affect overall model fit? It's also possible to drill down on the question of whether an individual observation is influential on a particular parameter estimate. So this next line down here looks at the parameter the influence on a parameter associated with part of my structural model. And in this model, in this case, excuse me, in this case, I'm looking at influence with respect to one particular loadings estimate. So I'll run that. That'll take a little while to cook. And the result out of the parameter influence is one of you know, two very large rows, the first row will provide me some information as to whether the parameter is going to change. And the second one will, where appropriate, give me the generalized Cook's distance. In the case of a factor model, I'm only going to get changes in the parameter estimate. But we can take a look at that. So inside here, I have some individuals who, if removed, are going to greatly result in a change for the larger of that loading. You know, and that 0.4 is a pretty big value. 
Uh, so you know, as you're looking at these things, this is a way to identify one individual for one parameter who might give you, you know, rather dramatically different conclusions depending on whether you put them in the model or didn't. In this particular case, I'd recommend you go back and take a look at observation, what does it appear to be 120, 100, yeah, 120, 125, um, who is particularly influential. So if you want, you can apply the same logic to any other structural model. The only thing that in order for this to run in its current form is you need to remove the name of the parameter as you run it uh, in order for the code to work. So the next thing I'd like to talk about is generating factor scores. So in our diagram, remember, we have two latent variables, a random intercept variable and a random slope variable. And in a growth curve model, latent variables have means associated with them. In terms of our diagram, remember that the picture that we have has a circle that points at several of the manifest variables. Well, that picture is similar to a one predictor regression. In other words, if our circle were a square, that structural equation model would be simply saying, here is this one predictor variable, and it predicts WISP time one, time two, time three, time four. In order for us to check on the linearity assumption, that is, is this regression slope a straight line or not, I'm going to have to generate something called factor scores. Now, factor scores are not magic. They are simply a regression-based estimate. Or you can use empirical Bayes estimates. That's another topic. It's a way of getting some numbers that are a guess of what the latent variable value is. It's not true. Having said that, it is useful for checking the assumption of linearity. To get factor scores out, I'm going to generate a case ID here. And I'm going to use the lab predict statement. So I will need to use the result out of the lab inspect. I had you know, my, model, my answers. And that will give me a matrix of factor scores. So upstairs, you can see that I've got one to 204 rows, as many people as I have in my study, and I have two columns for the two latent variables that I have in my model. What I need to do is to take this matrix of factor scores and then attach that to my data. So what I've written here is a little bit of code to do that appending onto the side. <clears throat> There may be better ways to do this uh, using other ways of manipulating matrices in R, but you know, this works and it's a, something that I understand. So now we have the data set model data, <coughs> which has the four times of measurement that I have and the factor scores for everybody. I can take a look at the very beginning of that. And here's what the first six observations look like. Once I've got my factor scores, I'm now in a position to do lowest regressions. In order for me to do lowest regressions, I'll need to sort the data by one of the factor scores. So in this case, Suppose I'm interested in looking at whether the relationship between the latent variable, the slope, is linear in predicting WISC time one, time two, time three, time four. <clears throat> so this order command 
sorts the data, and it creates a new version of my data set called sorted data. Excuse me. There. And in order to do the lowest regressions, I need to specify the span. So remember that lowest regression is a running average of what the regression line could be, taking little snapshots and smoothing them, called a window. In our language, this is called a span. So because I like to do things in a variety of ways, I'm going to play around with different spans here. Um, two, three, four. Having done that, I now need to generate the predicted lowest curves. So I named these all with these names. I'm going to generate the predicted values here. Two, three, four. And now I want to use the plot statement. So I'm going to be plotting each of these data sets. This is the sorted data set based on the slope value. I want to do a linear regression and I'm going to put some labels on of what this is. I want to label the X variable and I want to label the Y variable. So let's just run that thing. And here we have a connect the dots version of our data. This is not lowest, this is just what, to, what are the data points sorted by the slope? At that point, I can do smoothing with a span of 10. Doing things in class is always exciting. I swear this ran, gang, the last time I did it. I'll have to fix that for you. This plot is supposed to go up there, but the message that you can see here is that a very small span gives me lots of ups and downs in the lowest regression, and a very large span starts to do look more and more linear. And generally speaking, this relationship is linear. I'm absolutely puzzled as to why that doesn't look any better. I'll get back to that and fix it and send it out to you. So um, should these uh, lines, the smoother one, the colorful one, be closer to the original line? Yeah, they should. Is that the problem? <laughs> when I ran it before, uh -huh. When I was preparing for class, these were entirely overlapping numbers, but I'm not sure why it's not showing me the curve that I want to show because all I'm doing is adding the smooth lines. So uh, I have a question. Okay. For um, this graph, if it is, if it looks linear, mm -hmm. do we need to, I, I guess this smoothing is for the things that have uh, some curve inside the the line has some curve, but if it is linear, so we don't need to use this smoothing function. You're just checking, right, you're just checking on the relationship between the predictor variable, that is the latent variable, and the manifest variable. Because if that's not going to be, a, if that's not a straight line, we shouldn't be estimating a regression weight. We should be estimating either, we should be adjusting the WISC scores so that we're capturing a straight line, mm -hmm. or we should be you know, maybe considering a more complicated model like nonlinear factor analysis, which we're not going to get into in this class. Uh, we'll get into in the next one uh, as an alternative. Okay, I got it. Thank right. you. Okay, so I'll get this fixed for you and send you the code out. So the next topic that I want to talk about 
is the issue of reliability. So let's think for a minute about what is wrong with regression and analysis of variance. And I'll repeat myself that one of the things that we do in, when we write up our analyses of regression is we speak a little bit out of two sides of our mouths. We will say things like, my critical thinking test has a reliability of 0.8, and it's a predictor of, say, reflective judgment or grades in school. And that's not what a reliability model, what a regression model says. The regression model assumes that the predictor variable is measured without error. Those errors of prediction can occur in the criterion variable, in your Y variable. And we have a part of the model that says we will not completely accurately replicate this study if we turned around and did it again, because errors of prediction will be slightly different. Measurement error in the Y variable is one of the reasons why our prediction is less than perfect. In truth, there are many reasons why an error of prediction occurs for a given individual in a given study. Maybe it's measurement error. Maybe it's the day of the week that they were assessed, the temperature of the room, how happy they were that day. Anything that causes them to depart from their predicted value based on the predictors in the model. The X variable, however, is assumed to have no measurement error. It's also assumed to be fixed. That is, if I redid my study, I would observe exactly the same variance of X that I observed in this study. And that's not necessarily the case. There does exist something called random effects regression, and that would be part of a generalized linear modeling class, uh, and to some extent, a special model in a hierarchical linear model. But what we're wishing here is to adjust our X variable for the measurement error that is inherent in it. One of the ways of doing that is to do something called correction for attenuation. That is, I'm going to specify my standard regression model, but I'm going to access some external information called a reliability coefficient or an intra-class correlation coefficient, which will allow me to redo my model, adjusting for measurement error in the predictor. Before I get into that, it's always helpful to clear out a few cobwebs and to rehearse what we mean by these terms. So let's start there. The reliability coefficient is a measure of the proportion of a score that is due to the true score. That is, you know, a regular old regression looks like this. And what we're saying is the observed variance of y is equal to the predicted variance of y plus error. And in classical test theory, we have an equation that looks very similar to that. We say the observed variance of y is equal to the true score variance plus the error variance. So, if we knew the true score variance, the squared multiple correlation predicting y is the reliability coefficient. In an equation form, I'm going coefficient alpha is equal to true score variance divided by observed variance. Maybe when you took test theory, you saw this equation, true score variance is equal to so the reliability is true score variance divided by true score variance plus error variance. But these two terms down here added together are simply the variance of y. 
Are we good? Okay, so it goes from zero to one. It can never be negative. So the thing about structural equation modeling is it's like playing with blocks or little toys. When I was growing up, might not surprise you to learn we had Lincoln logs, we had tinker toys, and you would, you know, snap some things together and make it part of a larger picture. So there's a couple, here's a little picture that shows this equation. I'm in the deviation score mode. I'm not worrying about the mean being in the model. But I'm going to say that my observed variance of y, my observed variable y, is equal to true score variance plus error variance. This path diagram is a statement about the variance of y. So I could think of it as a structural equation model. There's one manifest variable, it has a variance. The variance of y is one times coefficient alpha times the variance of y, because alpha is the proportion of variance due to y, due to the true score, plus one times the variance of y times one minus a. A little bit of math saying, what does this di little rehearsal of our tracing rules, what does this diagram say about the variance of y? It's one times alpha variance of y times one plus one times variance of y times one minus alpha times one. And all those things added up together give you the variance of y. This diagram is, a is supposed to be a just identified model. So I have to have one free parameter in my model. What we often do is to allow this variance up here to be a free value. And downstairs, we go in and we find the observed variance of y in my data set and I multiply it by one minus the reliability coefficient. So that's the way you build this little puzzle piece. A second way of doing this that is useful to you is shown on the right. And what I'm doing here is I'm going to put in the standard deviation of y and fix that number. And one minus the reliability and fix that number. And freely estimate this number. It will again, however, give me the variance of y. That's going to be the standard deviation of the true score times one times the standard deviation of the true score plus the standard deviation of y times one minus alpha times the standard deviation of y. And all of that added up together gives me the variance of y. <clears throat> Why am I showing you this picture as opposed to the picture on the left? The picture on the left is what you will find in SEM books like Ken Boland's uh, structural equation modeling book. The picture on the right is a little bit useful to you more useful to you in testing assumptions, because as we're going to see, there are some problems with using coefficient alpha. And you may wish to explore different values for the reliability and rerun your model accordingly. So how do we estimate reliability? Well, that comes to us from software. If you are an SPSS person, you can get coefficient alpha out of the correlation routine. If you are a SAS user, PROC core, no miss alpha will give you coefficient alpha for a model. <clears throat> there are some good papers on how to calculate the intraclass correlation coefficient. <clears throat> 
the one that you are getting in <clears throat> software like R or SAS or SPSS is the third interclass correlation coefficient formula described in this original Schrupp Weiss piece. There are other estimates of reliability that you can have. For example, if you have an instrument that has, has correct answers, ones and zeros, like a classroom test, how many answers did you get correct? You don't want to use the coefficient alpha from Proc core. You want to go in and find yourself a testing program that will give you what are called the KR Cuda Richardson reliability formula. These are conceptually the same things. It gives you a proportion estimate of reliability. It does so, however, taking into account the fact that your variable is discrete and goes zero one. Small historical note, KR21 is what you're going to find in software these days. It's easy to calculate. KR18 is a little bit more accurate. If you spend the time to go back to Cooter and Richardson in 1937, they make that point. But just because it was easier to program, we use 21. So let's play with an example here. And let's ask ourselves the question, I'm interested in looking at some correlations adjusting for the reliability of the measures involved. So the example that I have here looks at three variables, alcohol, ACT English, and high school GPA. In this data set, this is what our correlation looks like. I can see that high school GPA and ACT are kind of correlated. And I have some correlations between GPA and alcohol and ACT and alcohol. To make this scenario a little bit interesting, say we looked in our test manual and we found that the reliability of the ACT subtest was 0.85. So in the usual decomposition, this is what we're going to show in the next model here, this is what this is going to look like. So in this case, I'm going to take the one minus the reliability, multiply it by the variance, and use that number and fix this error variance to be exactly that number. This will be fixed at the number one. This will be fixed at the number one. This will be freely estimated. Similarly, if I want to do the same thing in the newer way, one minus alpha is 0.15. The standard deviation of the ACT English test is 3.86, and this is a freely estimated value. The variance up here is fixed at the number one, and that's kind of handy because paths coming out of that or slings associated with this variance of one is going to give me a correlation coefficient, and maybe I want to think about things as a correlation. And I realize you've not had a chance to read this, so you know, take some time and read it through or look at the video when I can post it. So now we have our little building block and we can go in and we can start playing with it. And it's a good thing to sit down and start thinking about why do we care so much about measurement error and the predictor variable, and we don't necessarily care so much about measurement error in the criterion variable. And it helps for us to think about this as a scatter plot. So say I had some data points on a plot, and I start adding random error to them. Say I take this point and I add plus one to the y score, and I take this one and I subtract one from the Y score. As long as I've got an equal amount of positive and negative error that I'm adding to the data, that's not going to affect the slope of this regression line. If, however, I start to do the same thing with the X variables and I start moving 
this value and moving that value, that is going to start to affect the slope of my line. So that's an intuitive understanding from scatter plots as to why measurement error is pernicious in its effects on estimates of the slope of a regression line. So let's do a little one variable regression model and snap our little puzzle piece of correction for attenuation and see how that affects things. In terms of vector algebra, this is going to give me, if this is my true x, this is going to be the regression weight that I multiply the true x by to get that value. Well, the true x is always going to be a shorter vector than the vector of, that includes error in x. Therefore, my value here for this regression weight is going to be a different one. If I'm thinking about what vector algebra is in terms of measurement error, and by the way, if you don't like the vector stuff, this is fine. We have a path diagram that might be your preferred mode. Our true length of the regression line is 0.89. The actual length of a variable might be one. The error variance is going to be one minus alpha. So rather than doing a regression based on the observed y, I'm doing it with the shorter vector that represents the true scores. This also explains why we're doing the square root of alpha here. So this is a path diagram that shows us what the regression weight is predicting grades from alcohol, quantity frequency, if the score has been adjusted for measurement error. So what I did was I took, again, exactly that same previous path diagram, one minus alpha, I fixed this number, I fix this to be the standard deviation of y. In this case, to keep life simple, I was using the standardized versions. And I freely estimate this number. In this case, it's going to be a number very close to the square root of alpha. This number will be the regression weight adjusted for measurement error. So if this is a standardized score metric, that is, the variances of the variables are one, of the manifest variables, and the means are zero. What does this diagram say about the correlation or the trip going from alcohol to cumulative GPA? Well, it's going to be this number times one times this number. Remember, if I just had a single predictor model, that would be a path going just from alcohol to GPA. It's going to be the correlation. In this case, it's going to, this B up here is going to be the correlation divided by the square root of alpha. In other words, the number I'm going to get up here is going to be a bigger number a larger standardized coefficient than I would have gotten if I did not adjust the scores for measurement error. This is true for single predictor models. In other words, you're always going to get wider whites. You're going to get larger standardized regression weights, positive or negative in magnitude, with a single predictor model. It is not, however, the case that this is going to happen in the case of corrections for attenuation with more than one predictor. And I realize I am now at time, and we'll take this up next class time. All right.